This paper will tackle how feminist theological thought and the spirituality of Merton may be held in fruitful tension in 2021 by reflecting upon his relationship with M. Christian love requires that one neither excuses the potentially unjust power dynamics of their affair in the name of compassion, nor dismisses Merton's contribution completely due to his struggle as this is antithetical to the gospel. We are left with a prerogative to wrestle, to hold in tension the necessity of keeping our spiritual leaders accountable while finding in this a life-giving opportunity to build upon their contributions to our spiritual lives in gratitude. Thus, this feminist approach to Merton's spirituality will use theological imagination to reflect upon the absent voice of M herself, while recognizing that Thomas Merton's combination of Christian witness and mysticism continues to provide spiritual food for our own witness against the increasingly volatile social and political situations of recent years. When Merton met M in the spring of 1966, he was 51 years old and was beginning to live the life of solitude he had so craved in the hermitage in the hills above Gethsemane. His journal recounts an awareness of his advancing years and a myriad of physical ailments. In addition to digestion issues, Merton suffered from a benign tumor in his eye, bursitis in his elbow, knee problems, and the inflammation of his cervical vertebra, which led to his back surgery. In his journals, he is open about the anxiety the surgery causes him. He worries about further operations and prolonged convalescence. Given his solitude and midlife anxieties, it is not surprising that Merton took comfort and undoubtedly a boost in his ego when cared for by female nurses. They were simply doing their job, but Merton appreciated this female attention, perhaps attributing more to it than he should have, finding confidence and attention when he offered to send them each signed copies of his books. M, in particular, engaged in discussion with him regarding the sign of Jonas and the changes brought on by Vatican II. After a few minutes, they began talking about Peanuts cartoons and Mad Magazine. One wonders how long it had been since Merton held this sort of light-hearted conversation that was not strictly theological, political, or directly relevant to the practicalities of life in the monastery. Without condoning his decision to pursue the relationship, it is nonetheless easy to see why Merton felt himself renewed in his love for M. The question has yet to be answered, however, what M was pursuing in reciprocating this love, and if the relationship was just, as in, did the relationship do justice to her autonomy and need for relationship? Michael Mott tells us that certain of Merton's friends reacted to his romantic affair with M by congratulating him on being human. Merton himself, both during and after the affair, recognized that this struggle of being immersed in a state of romantic longing is one experienced by many religious. Those of us who have found a friend in Merton's writing have been overall forgiving of him, partly because his struggle with romantic love is relatable, and partly because of his immense contribution to spiritual contemplation, ecumenism, and Catholic social thought. Most importantly, however, Merton's journals and testimony from his friends who knew M describe it as a free and consensual relationship. Despite the large gap in age between the two, M was nonetheless an adult woman who seems to have been as eager to perpetuate the affair as Merton. Thus, Merton's affair with M has remained unexamined through the lens of Me Too. As Thomas Reese states, I can forgive Eve, the 12, Merton, and sins of weakness but I am not ready to forgive Abraham, David, Theodore McCarrick, Vanier, Harvey Weinstein, and others who abused their power to prey on the vulnerable. I will leave their forgiveness to God. However, the fruits of the Me Too movement have arguably not only been about calling out sexual abuse and demanding accountability. Rather, its fruits have also been an increased awareness of power dynamics within personal relationships, communities, and institutions. This awareness ideally transitions into seeking to prevent coercion and to promote justice in decision making. Furthermore, while Merton himself declared that the 66 to 67 journals should not be published until a quarter century after his death, he nonetheless wanted them published. 
though he would later reflect on his relationship with M as a mess, describing them as two broken people and harboring some shame at certain aspects of his behavior during this period. He did also draw lessons and humility from the relationship. One can only assume that in allowing us to read these most personal aspects of his life despite embarrassment, Merton thought we too, lay people, religious, monastics, could draw lessons from his quick descent into romantic love. Furthermore, Merton's spirituality, which pervaded every aspect of both his inner being and outward action, played a role in his affair as well. Thus, Merton's love for M was at times considered by him to be a divine call and a form of spiritual communion that he convinced himself further enriched his solitude. However, I argue that being honest with the particular manners in which Merton used spirituality to excuse his desire for M is reflective of the institutional Catholic Church's problematic attitude toward women, sexual attraction, and romantic love. In Merton's journals and later accounts about their affair, there are four aspects to Merton's attitude toward M which are indicative of unequal power dynamics within the relationship. These are his role as a priest and spiritual mentor to M, her lack of voice and autonomy in Merton's account, his view of the act of sex being the only potentially damaging and dangerous aspect of their romance, his lack of reflection on her own potentially traumatic history, and how this is tied to her need for him. What we know about M. At the time of her romance with Merton, M was a student nurse in her, in her early 20s, preparing for final exams and graduation. Originally from Cincinnati, M had moved to Louisville, Kentucky for her education and seems to have visited her family often. She was engaged to be married and her fiance was fighting in the Vietnam War. She was a practicing Catholic who partook in spiritual reading and educated herself regarding her faith tradition. Before meeting Merton in 1966, she already had questions and opinions on the liturgical changes of Vatican II, as well as the reflections on monasticism Merton wrote in The Sign of Jonas. Merton had become something of a celebrity in Catholic circles, and just as Merton was flattered by the attention paid him by a young woman, so she was flattered by his desire to engage in conversation with her regarding his writing. Before leaving the hospital, he gave her a copy of a preface yet to be published of one of his books. Prior to departing for Cincinnati to spend the Easter holiday with her parents, M expressed interest in visiting him at the monastery, though he told her this would not be possible. However, he expressed interest in sending her more of his writing, asking for her contact information. Upon her return to work from Cincinnati, M found Merton had left her a letter before being discharged from the hospital. In it, he told her he was lonely for friendship and gave details on how to write to him privately by addressing letters as conscience matters. It is easy to imagine that M was looking for friendship too. We can imagine this being a trying time for M. She has the stress which comes with completing the final steps of one's education. The man she presumably loves is fighting in the war. No matter the strength of their romantic connection, it is likely that his safety and perhaps even the, sa the state of their relationship was a source of worry. Attending mass, receiving the sacraments, and engaging in spiritual reading may have been for her what these practices are for many of us, forms of self-care that also provide a path to follow during times of difficulty. Furthermore, Merton is not only a priest, but a respected teacher of religious life. Though Merton may not have considered himself a leader, his status as a priest, published author, and someone considered to hold wisdom would have made him so in M's eyes. It is no wonder, therefore, that she was eager to correspond with him. Her first letter to Merton responded to this call for friendship. Having discussed their love for Peanuts characters, Mott writes that M wrote in a thought bubble next to a drawing of Snoopy, it's nice to have a friend. Merton responded to her letter with a declaration of love. While M would later put in as much effort, if not more, to perpetuate their romantic relationship, then, sorry, excuse me, then Merton himself, these first days after his declaration seemed to have worried her greatly. Seeking spiritual counsel from a more objective source, M sought out the advice of another priest. 
he confirmed her sense that a relationship which endangered the vows of a priest would be sinful. He advised her to call off the relationship. However, before she leaves, Mott tells us that he, quote, tries to make propositions of his own, end quote. Whether Mott means that the priest was preying on her vulnerability or proposing different options is unclear. After this experience, M decides to move forward with a romantic relationship with Martin. She is nonetheless still anxious. Upon revealing all these troubles to Martin at their first meeting as lovers, Martin seeks to console her with a poem that further attests to his love for her, but neglects to attend to her worry regarding what she has been taught to see as the sinful nature of such a relationship, both due to her engagement and his vows. Martin further comforted M about the nature of their relationship by asserting that it came from God, that his solitude and spiritual life could only be deepened by his love for her. According to his journals, Merton further convinces himself of her need for him, stating, the basic fact is that she does love me. She does need me from a certain, she does need from me a certain kind of love that will support her and help her believe in herself and get free from destructive patterns and attachments that are likely to wreck her. Repeated statements such as this one throughout the four months of their romantic relationship show little to no introspection on Merton's part that he may be acting as a destructive force. Rather, Merton continually asserts that their abstaining from full consummation of their relationship is demonstrative of the purity of their love. James A. Wiseman notes that Merton underestimated the power of sexual desire in his assertions that he would never touch M, noting that their relationship quickly became physical. However, as Merton conflated only the act of sexual penetration with breaking his vows, he considered himself faithful to his vows. He further considered this to be respectful of M's chastity, seeing her as an end in herself rather than means to sexual gratification that could be discarded. However, this conflation of sexual abstinence with celibacy and chastity allowed Merton to neglect the psychological, spiritual, and emotional toll of the relationship on M. Despite avoiding sex, Merton reveals that they kissed and were physically intimate in other ways. While Merton never seized his assurances of love for her, he was fickle with his plans and promises. Part of this was due to his being a hermit monk with little access to a phone and transportation, having to continually rely on others to enable their meetings. However, much of this was also Merton's indecision on how or even whether or not to continue their romance. M's plans to visit the monastery grounds were risky and difficult to orchestrate. When Merton canceled them due to last minute doubts, she not only had the sorrow, the sorrow of canceled plans, but presumably had the embarrassment of having to reveal to the friend offering to drive her why their aid was no longer needed. However, most heartbreaking are the conversations in which Merton recounts having fantasized with M about their potential lives as a married couple particularly as Merton repeats throughout his journals that such a thing would be impossible, even admonishing M in his journal for believing he could leave his solitude to start a new life with her. In other words, while his admonishment may not have been explicitly said to her out loud, he was gaslighting her in his promises and behavior. Believing there was potential for a future together, M began making decisions based on these possibilities, however unlikely. She entertains the thought of a life without her fiance, a life of celibacy, a life wherein even if she cannot have Merton as her husband, he remains her one and only true love. In May, she struggles through exams, not having studied enough and deciding to stay on in Louisville rather than return to Cincinnati, just so she can potentially see Merton on weekends. The realization of the unsustainability of their relationship only begins to hit in June after the discovery of their conversations by Abbott James Fox in late May. Though they share a meeting in Jim Weigel's office in June with champagne records and talking of what life together might look like, Merton then repeatedly cancels plans for her to come visit him at the monastery. At the end of June, M worries her fiance has assumed the romantic nature of her and Merton's relationship after having come upon one of Merton's letters. He is then declared missing in action overseas. 
It is unclear from Merton's journal how this news affected M, whether she felt guilt or worry. She and Merton met once more in July at a park where each affirmed their love for the other. Merton could no longer receive mail as a conscience matter and M's letters were continually intercepted by Abbott Fox. She went so far as to leave her letter for him at the Merton Center at Bellarmine University. He perpetuates their correspondence through the friendship of a religious sister who herself is struggling with romantic feelings towards someone and delivers a letter to M. The happiness with which M is reported to have received the letter is indicative of a lingering hope on her part, which is heartbreaking, particularly when one considers that Merton had already, at this point, formally decided and vowed to remain a hermit. Even so, there were few interactions between the two after the summer of 1966, apart from a few very brief phone calls and short hospital visits that only seemed to cement that they were headed along separate paths. Um, let me, I know I only have a little bit of time left, so I'm gonna skip over a part. All right. One of the few times he quotes M is in one of their final meetings at a park in Louisville in July, where M calls him the only true, kind, and gentle person she has ever known. Such a statement may be indicative that M has suffered deeply in the past, that she has experienced a lack of love and perhaps even cruelty. Knowing him as the only truly kind person and one who proclaims to love her so deeply, it is no wonder that she did all in her power to continue their romance. In her articulation of a renewed sexual ethic, Margaret Farley notes that while sex can be used as a way to harm and betray the human person, it is also true that, quote, relationships with others, ourselves, God, always have moral elements. So the sex or lack of sex in them may be of less genuine moral significance than our elements such as respect, trust, honesty, fairness, and faithfulness, end quote. It is evident that Merton loved M and that she loved him in return. It is also evident from Merton's journals that he saw abstaining from sex as a way of not only keeping his vow, but respecting M's chastity and autonomy. However, he seems to equate respect for her with abstinence. He thus neglects the manners in which leading her on in a relationship without a future was indeed a betrayal. There is dishonesty and duplicity not only in what he tells himself of their love, but what he shows her in, is the potential of their love. Viewing sex as the penultimate act of romantic love, he may see himself as preserving their relationship, but he also neglects the ways in which all of their other interactions as lovers cultivate her love and desire for his love. The burden is placed on sex without attention to the letters, caresses, intimate moments, which all play a role in further attaching them to one another. This inattention to harm outside the sexual act, along with an unquestioned assumption that M needs him, further enables Merton to overlook her potential past suffering and therefore not take into it into account. After congratulating him on his humanity, Merton's friends, apart from Laughlin and Father Bamberger, worry primarily about Merton's potential towards self-destruction through his affair with M. M is viewed as the temptress. While Merton is quick to defend her, upset that his friends see him only as the only one affected, he nonetheless continues to act in a manner that betrays her own selfish, his own selfish needs. Finally, even in his perhaps commendable honesty in deciding to eventually reveal his journals and poetry of which M is the subject, M is not given a choice in the matter, nor does he hide her name. This was done by courtesy of his editor. This paper has been an attempt at reading the affair through her perspective, but as she has no voice of her own in this account, there is likely much we do not know and will never know. Merton continued to check up on M in a series of short phone calls throughout 1967. She was crying and encouraged him to leave monastic life to find happiness. It is apparent that despite the shame Merton felt at his behavior, he nonetheless still loved M. In burning her letters, paradoxically, he, he proved this. How can he continue as a monk without the woman he loves and have her words be so nearly accessible? 
While I do not doubt Martin loved him, it remains my argument that he loved her as an idealized personification of feminine love and saw in her another chance rather than a complex human being. His repeated emphasis on her as a girl rather than a woman and his lack of reflection on her own history betray this. We know Merton's vulnerability and brokenness because of the generosity and honesty with which he wrote. We know he suffered from what he felt was a lack of maternal affection, friendships, and committed romantic relationships, which mark his younger years. We do not know the history of M's heart. Nor does Martin take the time to ruminate in his journals on how this experience affects her faith life. Um, in 1967, Merton wrote, well, if these notes help two people to love each other better and with more trust in love's truth, then all that happened between me and M was worthwhile. While we cannot speak for M as to how she views their relationship in retrospect, we can speak to how a greater concern for M's motivations, history, and a place in life, as well as the unequal power dynamics which mark the start of their communication, would have perhaps aided Merton in loving M more fully in the truth. It also calls into question whether Merton is right in declaring the inevitability of a love based in sexual desire. Not because we can change the past, but because we can envision deep spiritual friendship between men and women as a fruitful option. Thank you.